And then when it gets to the other end, they've wiped the postmark off, <laughs> put a new address label on, put the discs in, put more Pritt stick on and send it back. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode was recorded right here at the Retro Collective and some of you were here to enjoy it live with us. It's just one example of how we're using both the cave and arcade archive museums to bring you closer to the stories we care about while capturing them to share. If you'd like to come and visit us then head to retrocollective.co.uk where you can book regular gaming, special guest speaker and patron days if you're signed up as a supporter. That's retrocollective.co.uk and we hope to see you here someday soon. Sound okay? We've got sound. Action. Action. Uh, ha ha hello everyone. Um, uh, my name's Ian. I'm also known as uh, Hoffman. I've also had a bunch of other names. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about why I love computers. Um, so uh, a bit about myself. Um, I'm a Salisbury lad. Um, if you know where Salisbury is. We've got a, a spire, it's 123 meters tall. Um, uh, I'm a musician, not in the standard sense of I really play any instruments, but um, I've used computers to make music for a very, very long time. Um, I'm also a DJ um, and a bit of a coder and a demo scener. If you've never seen, if you don't know what a demo scener is, we'll get to that and explain kind of what that is. Um, and also stream on Twitch. Um, to, if anyone's got any questions at any point, Put your hand up, you know, you know, don't be shy. Um, I've also got some questions for you because uh, I'm interested to see if uh, kind of our experiences are kind of similar in any way, shape or form. My first question uh, to the room is, uh, what was your first computer? Uh, anyone? ZX81. ZX81? Xbox 360. <laughs> A Dragon 32. Oh, the green machine. Brilliant. Uh, anyone else? 48K Specky. 48K Specky. Mega Drive, Master System, Master System. So PC, BBC. BBC. Oh, the uh, the British stalwart. <laughs> oh, this is a nice, nice with a cup of tea. <laughs> um, so myself, my first ever experience with a computer was the ZX81. Now uh, uh, I was really lucky uh, because in my house, my dad loved technology. Like as soon as the ZX81 came out and it was available to buy, not in kit form as pre-built, he was, he was straight onto it. Um, so this is obviously my first, ex first experience of gaming at home, was, uh, is it 3D Monster Maze? Yeah. Um, of course, what with him being so into technology, we very quickly ended up with one of these, as that Spectrum, 16K, absolutely hosed, right? <laughs> so uh, a friend of ours, uh, well, a friend of my brother's across the street had a 48K Spectrum and lots of 48K games and I was incredibly jealous. I would try and load them on my 16K Spectrum, but it would not work. Um, but we had obviously the Horizons tape. Now, who, who remembers the Horizons tape? Yeah, yeah. Now, what, how did you feel about the, did, when you played that Horizons tape, but what was, you know, what, how did it make you feel? Was it like, were you like bored with it? Didn't spend much time didn't, with it. Didn't spend much time with it, no. So now the, the funny thing about that Horizons tape is that, I, it's weird, it feels like it, it triggered something in me, right? It was just, it felt like magic in this thing, right? And you could see that, oh, yeah. For the non-specky people, what was it? Oh, yeah, so the Horizons tape was like an introduction to your computer, right? So uh, with your manual, it'll tell you how to use your ZX Spectrum. You put that in and basically it'll do presentations. It, it does like graphical displays of, you know, how the Spectrum works. Um, and if you're really lucky, you got to the end of the tape, you had a, a, a pretty bad breakout clone. <laughs> it was pretty terrible. It's pretty much the most donated tape here. Yes, it's very popular. It's very popular. Um, but the thing that really uh, caught my eye with this is just, was just, it just felt like it was magic, right? Like this thing was, you know, making those weird noises whilst it loaded, which uh, is, you know, somehow strangely comforting to me. I don't know if anyone else has that experience. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so um, I didn't really, you know, it was, again, it was my dad, so I got to play on it every now and then, but um, 
really it was his. Um, him being the tinkerer that he was, um, decided to write a fruit machine simulator in basic on it, um, which um, uh, I've got to give him his credit, was pretty damn impressive. Um, Do and you it, have it? Huh? Do you have it? No, sadly not. I wish I, I, I tell you, I wish I did. I really do wish I did. Um, but yep, uh, being the uh, follower of technology, I'm sure you know where this is going. We ended up with a Commodore 64. <laughs> um, now this is really where I started. Um, so I was lucky enough to eventually get my own um, through uh, much, much badgering for Christmas one year. Um, uh, it was actually the family computer to start with. So we would uh, you know, get it out, put it on the big telly, and everyone would play the games with it. We had an Eddie Kids Jump Challenge. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers that. It wasn't great, but God, we had fun with it, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, this, this was the machine that really kind of, you know, it cemented itself with me. The SID chip, obviously, everyone knows what the SID chip is. Fantastic little sound chip. Um, so in terms of musical influences, this is really where... Um, you know, this machine was like a, a real influence on me. So the first day I got um, a copy of, I don't know if you've played the game Parallax? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Soundtrack on that by Martin Galway, 10 minutes long. Absolutely transfixed me as a child. It just blew my mind, this thing. It's amazing. Obviously, Rob Hubbard. And of course, outside of that, in you know, terms of popular music, Jean-Michel Jarre, basically anything with a synthesizer, I, I was in. I, I wanted in. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, uh, oh yeah, and then um, in terms of tinkerings, um, so I wasn't, uh, you, know, I, you know, like a lot of people when they've got computers, they, like, they, you know, they just use it to play games. I was always interested in kind of how things worked, what you could do with it. So this being the, not, not necessarily just a, uh, a, a means of um, maybe circumventing copy protections and making a legal backup of software. Uh, the action replay cartridge, um, you could do so much more with this thing. So I would go in and find the text of, uh, of um, uh, like uh, names and stuff inside the game, then go and change them, and then save that as my version of the game, um, add cheats and the rest of it. Um, so it's a great little cartridge. <clears throat> and also this tape here, Micro Rhythm. I see a, a nodding at the back had that as well, yeah. So it, it was basic, right? It, it was just, I think it played, was it drum samples? Yeah, drum samples. Yeah, drum samples. You could pl program your own drum loops in it. And uh, I, I, when I first got it, I could not put it down. It was just like, this is amazing. I can, I can make music with it, right? I just loved this thing. Um, so, uh, ah, so here's an interesting question for the group. How on earth did you meet other kids who also love computers? Micromart. Micromart? Yeah. Oh, so see the adverts in newspapers. Playground. In the playground, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Software piracy. Software piracy, yeah. <laughs> that's a good one, yeah. Yeah, so this you know, you kind of, yeah, some similar experiences. The Micromart is where like, I found a lot of trading contacts that weren't in my local yeah. area. But in my local area, um, I would, we end up finding people that like, had the same computer as you, right? And these were, these were my, this was my crew, basically. So Clive Minikin um, is, uh, uh, I met him through my brother, who was in a band with his brother. And they said, we've got C64s. Why don't we get our brothers together? And then they can play C64. So that's how I met Clive. Uh, Ian and Andy Jolly I met um, because a friend of mine at school said uh, uh, he had an MSX. And I was like, what on earth is one of those? I was like, well, I'd have to meet him because he's got something I've never seen before that's a computer that's all new and fangled. Um, Andy's his brother and Phil, a.k.a. Redacted, a.k.a. Galahad. Um, uh, uh, I met him through uh, finding a locally uh, swapped disc uh, where, with a game that he uh, removed the copy protection on and in the intro, uh, slagged us all off. <laughs> so, uh, and then obviously we met up and became great friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I uh, kind of met through these, these people through various different computers, through friends and, you know, local connections and stuff. Um, and then obviously, you know, we ended up getting Amigas. This one being my dad's. 
Um, obviously not actually this one. This is obviously stolen off of Google Images. Um, but I only saw this three months of the year. And you're probably wondering why am I only seeing this three months of the year? So my dad was in the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but it's, it's not the Navy, but basically, yeah, it meant he was only home for three months of the year. So when he first got it, um, I was in awe of this thing. It was amazing. And then I'd play it for three months and then it would disappear and I'd be stuck in my Commodore 64 again. Um, until eventually uh, uh, I convinced him to get me one for, for myself for Christmas one year. Um, so yeah, with the Amiga, um, we discovered the demo scene. And that's kind of through the, like, the Micro Mart um, and through newspapers. Uh, I found 17-bit uh, software and other public domain companies. Um, and I was tinkering with the Amiga doing like little bits of music and little discs with things on where we'd sample a record and then put it on the put it on the disc so it would play so we were doing these little bits and pieces and I would like trade stuff with these uh public domain companies saying I've here's here's stuff that I've made oh great yeah we'll have that and uh, is there anything you know you want from the catalog yeah great so obviously we found uh, who who's ever seen uh, I mean everyone must have seen the Bud Brain mega demo yeah so that's a it's an absolute classic this one here does anyone know what this one is Yes, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, that's Pugsy, which was a, a bit of a story demo, uh, quite fun. Um, so yeah, so we discovered the, uh, the demo scene. Um, we didn't really know it was really the demo scene at the time, but you know, kind of getting all these discs with all these amazing like graphical feats on them. We're like, well, this is, this is amazing. So, ah, so here's, a, here's another question for you. Where did the demo scene come from? The bedroom? Well, there's, there's kind of, yes, to a degree. The no takers? Cl close enough, yes. Piracy! <laughs> um, so this is a, 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 a fine example of a what's known as a crack intro. So on pirated software, and you'll see this on most people streaming uh, uh, Amiga uh, uh, stuff on, online. If they're, not doing a, if they're doing it from like original ADFs, over, I say original ADFs, obviously. Um, they, you usually see these because you know that's that's the you know generally traded version of those games these days. You know, um, so once the group had removed the copy protection, they wanted to put their stamp on it. And I love this term here, digital graffiti. So it's like they're spraying on the wall, right, and then you know darting off, right. Um, and this is another beautiful example. Obviously, you see uh, this uh, lovely message to another group called Quartex. Um, uh, obviously slagging them off for something that they've done uh, or something that they did wrong. Maybe they didn't crack a recent game correctly. Uh, so they'd have like these wars that, and you, like if you go through like, like various intros over the years, you will see in them, there is like actually certain story events that happen. Um, there's particularly, there's a particularly nasty one that I think it was Paradox did uh, for Angels. I'm not showing that. <laughs> All right, we're not. You can go and find it yourself. Um, but that's effectively what happened, right? This, so they were coding these intros and, they, and then, you know, they become this whole one-upmanship in, in like the piracy scene. Like we, we got there first, we've cracked it properly and the rest of it. That translated into these intros, right? So they're like, we've got the best intro. Ours looks the best. Ours has the best music, you know, and that just kind of keeps going and going and going. Everyone's like, well, you know, we've got more sprites on the screen and whatever. So and that's kind of where it all stems from. And that kind of that the eventually, like further on down the line, those two paths split away, right? Because the people that want to do just like cool things with computers don't really want to be associated with piracy because it could affect their job prospects later on, right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, us as a as a little team back in Salisbury, we wanted in on the action, so we kind of allotted ourselves roles. So uh, Clive uh, was doing a computer science degree. Um, he wanted to do the code. Uh, Ian, uh, who called himself Xanadu, uh, was good at, you know, did lots of drawing and liked to do pixel art. So, um, uh, and he also did a bit of music as well. Uh, and myself, I called myself Hydelide back then. Um, I was just, I lotted myself to do the music. I've, I loved music, so that's what I wanted to do. And uh, Andy, who's uh, Ian's brother, was mostly there for moral support. So... Um, so yeah, uh, and then we became a, a, a short-lived group called Scandal, right? We, we, we did like, I think we did one thing, but I can't actually find any uh, history of that 
online anywhere. We're all in. We're you know we're trying to you know, work out how we uh, make a production or, or or you know how we get into the demo scene. This first thing that we put out had got caught the interest of um, uh, another group called Flashing Bites, and they said, "Well, wow, we like kind of what you're doing with your music and your and your graphics. So why don't you come and join us? We've got other members, other musicians, other coders. You know, we can share ideas and stuff." Um, and this was our first production. And so it's a music disc released in May. 1991. God, I'm old. Um, uh, so yeah, it was just a, a disc. You put it into your Amiga. It starts playing the music and um, you can um, select which tune you want to listen to. Um, and I can show you that right now if everything works correctly. Um, and I apologize for some of the fruity language that is in the scroll text because... Um, Got to some of the tunes that uh, I made for this thing. Ooh, mine are a bit louder. <laughs> uh, can you do the maths for me? It was 1991, I was born in 77. Thank you, 14. 14.15. So yeah, very long time ago. <laughs> I know, it's loading the next one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, our code was able to get it, you know, working, but you know, we, we couldn't do seamless transitions whilst loading off disk by this point, right? We weren't that good. Huh? Nippon, Nippon, Nippon. So yeah, you get the, you get the general idea. That's um, and then um, uh, as with these things, everyone's still quite young, you know, a bit bolshy, a bit bigger than themselves. Um, uh, there was a bit of a change in management. Um, it's about the best way I can describe what happened to Flashing Bites. The guy that was running it, um, uh, there was another member. Um, I can't remember half of anyone's names to be honest. It was such a long time ago. But basically, uh, wasn't happy with how things were being run, so took over the group and then merged us into another group called Quartz, right? <laughs> Don't ask me why. <laughs> um, uh, so this is our, our next, so obviously the other parts of the group were releasing bits and pieces, um, but this is just like stuff that, you know, in our little group in Salisbury, this is what we were doing. Um, and Project Techno was uh, a, a thing that I really wanted to do. There was um, another music disc called um, Digital Concert, and you'd put the disc in and it would do a continuous piece of music, like it would load extra bits off the disc. Uh, so you'd have like one continuous piece of music for like 30 minutes or whatever. And that's what we did with this. Um, but it's in 1992. So I bet you can guess uh, what type of music this is going to be. Uh, here we go. Oh my goodness, we even got a bit of an intro on this. <laughs> so 
get. I mean, we won't watch the whole 34 minutes today. <laughs> so. There we go. That's so. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's quartz. That's probably one of our um, uh, kind of most successful productions back then, I guess. Um, uh, I didn't really uh, know kind of what effect it was having. We'd like make the disc. We'd send it off to like the you know, the other members of the group, and then you know it was. It was out there, but we didn't really see. And it's, it's not until later in, in life you bump into people and they're like, oh, I remember that thing that you did back in 92. How do you even, what? <laughs> so, so um, how were they made? So essentially three pieces of kit <clears throat> were used to make all of these demos. Um, so Def Pack is the assembler that um, Clive used. Uh, Deluxe paint is obviously, you know, the, it faced basically the uh, 90s industry standard of uh, paint packages. Um, and Pro Tracker, because that's really the only, th if you're going to have your music in anything like a game or a demo, it unfortunately has to be Pro Tracker. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> obviously, other bits and pieces are used. Like with Pro Tracker, we'd have like a sampler. So we'd use, uh, I think we had an Audio Master 2, um, plug that in, sample CDs. Um, for the deluxe paint stuff, um, I think Ian also had one of those uh, drag scanners. I don't know if you remember those. So he'd like he'd like sketch stuff out in pencil and then drag scan it and then pixel it back in afterwards, which is really great. Um, and obviously Dev Pack, um, yeah, we uh, uh, Clive did all the work for that. So so yeah, that's how they were made. Um, okay, so a question: Still no internet. So how do you share digital information back in the nineties? So, anyone? Bulletin boards? Bulletin boards? Sneak net. Sneak net. I've never heard of sneak net. Snail mail. Snail mail. Snail mail. Yes. Both all correct. Yes. Um, so, in the, at least in the piracy and the demo scene, swappers were the backbone of it, right? If you want to get your, if, if, if you have to have, a, you know, some good swappers in your group because they need to get your productions or your releases out there, right? Um, so the backbone of it, and they did it via snail mail, or they'd use a, uh, this is actually the modem I had. It was massive. It was about that big, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, so they'd go onto bulletin board systems, they'd upload, and they'd trade across all these places. So, but as you can imagine, back in the 90s, calls on this thing are expensive, and posting these things are expensive. But there's ways around that, right? <laughs> so free data. So uh, the Pritt Stick one's my, uh, my personal favorite, right? So the Pritt Stick we used for, for the stamps, right? So you'd uh, put your address label on, put your stamps on, and then you get your Pritt Stick, and then you cover over the stamps, right? Just put a nice layer of Pritt Stick over the top, and then you post your parcel, and then when it gets to the other end, they wipe the postmark off, <laughs> put a new address label on, put the discs in, put more Pritt Stick on, and send it back. <laughs> okay? Uh, another method was blue boxing or white boxing or basically foam freaking. So um, you could run a program on your Amiga that would generate the engineer's tones, right? So the trick was is you dial an 0800 number inside the UK and then you send an engineer tone that breaks the line from that 0800 call and then can dial basically anywhere in the US for nothing. So basically you'd end up like the, the connections would be, you know, obviously you know, 90s phone calls to the US, pretty ropey. So the, the data transfer, you know, it was, it was good, but it was like about half the speed you get out of your modem. Um, but you could call anywhere in the US for free. Um, someone worked out how to do it in the UK, and then within about two months, uh, BT shut the whole thing down. So <laughs> they weren't bothered about you calling the US, but as soon as you started calling inside the UK, they were a bit upset by that. Um, the other method is um, fraudulent AT&T calling cards. Now, um, I don't know if you know, so you know, probably when you used to go on holiday years ago, you'd go and get a calling card, you know, you top that up, right? And then you'd be able to make phone calls. So basically they, they have these in America, right? AT&T. Um, and because obviously they're in America, people would like either hack uh, answering machines or somehow get the numbers of people's AT&T calling cards and then share them around the group. And then the group would use them to make phone calls, right? But of course it's in the UK, like, it's like, well, that's a bit of fraud. Do we track it? Well, it's not really worth it, is it? Um, so yeah, that's uh, <coughs> that's um, uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's some of the methods we use to get free data. 
Oh, question. For the purpose of putting this on YouTube, can you just say allegedly? Allegedly. Uh, allegedly. <laughs> None of these methods work anymore. <laughs> that includes the brickstick. <laughs> <laughs> that includes, well, the stamps are, are no longer a thing pretty soon. So obviously they finally got wise. So, um, so I posted this uh, image on uh, social media uh, this week. And, it ca and these two uh, responses... Well, I, I love these. I didn't quite get the screenshot right on this one. But effectively, uh, what um, this gentleman was doing here was uh, they would uh, post it to a fake, uh, they post their parcel to a fake free post address, right? But then put the destination address as the return address on the back. And the post office would go, oh, we can't deliver that there. Let's return that somewhere else. And this worked. <laughs> this didn't only just work in the... So, so this happened in the Netherlands, but they were able to return postage to the UK and everywhere else in Europe. <laughs> Which I thought was brilliant. The other one is a, a, a friend of mine that um, will remain nameless for obvious reasons. Um, actually had like, when they'd set up like a, a trade with someone, they would basically have one parcel that would, that would do the job, right? So they cover it in brown tape, um, attach the stamps, put tape over them. So that it's, you know, I mean, use good tape so it doesn't look, you know, you can just wipe off the print mark on that. It's not, no print stick involved. And then they'd have a reversible address. So they'd make the address like a, a thing that's covered in tape. So that they would then basically put the discs in, send it to their friend. Their friend would uh, open the parcel, take the discs out, put the new discs in, take the address label, flip it round, stick it back on, and then wipe off the postage stamp. And they'd just use that one parcel to go back and forth <laughs> between those two people for, well, in, well, for about a year until... Criminal, obviously. Don't do this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now we get into uh, uh, something that I'm, I'm going to admit to you now, which is uh, uh, a fun thing that I did uh, when I was at college. So as I told you earlier, you know the, uh, the blue boxing where you could call a number in the US. So um, uh, I got a phone number for some American chat lines, right? Where you could ring up and just chat to people, right? Now, like party lines like, oh, wait, no, one, 50, 50, 50, like that, right? But in America. So, um, so I obviously memorized the 0800 number. And then I recorded the tones, the break tone and the dialing number from my Amiga onto a cassette into my personal stereo. And then I took myself and about six of my mates from college down to the set of phone boxes outside the library in Salisbury. And there's like seven or eight of them there. And then I've walked into the first phone box, connected that to the party line, passed it to, the, to a friend of mine, went into the next box, hacked that one, passed it to a friend of mine. So we hacked all seven boxes, <laughs> like all of us chatting to people in America or <laughs> just on a lunchtime because it's a fun thing to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh yes, so yes, yeah, so we are heading into the college years, um, uh, finally old enough to go to raves, yes, um, and this page has been intentionally left blank, uh, just like my mind uh, in this uh, era, so um, yes, uh, the college years, um, so I was kind of going to raves, um, in terms of us as a group, um, Flashing Bites Quartz, you know, my local crew, um, we decided to kind of, well, they kind of decided to kind of step away from the demo scene a bit. And this was our first idea in terms of uh, we were going to make uh, music discs that we would send out to um, games companies because we wanted to make music for games, right? Then we made three of these volumes and we posted them to all the games companies and we got no replies whatsoever. <laughs> so uh, feels like a kind of wasted effort, but, you know, we got three music discs out of it, right? <laughs> so... Um, eventually the guys um, uh, went full, full leather and went, yeah, we're going to make a game. And they, and they did it. So they made a game called Spurious Legacy, which is like, a, 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 I don't know, has anyone ever played it? Yeah, yeah one person, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it's like a, um, a, like a Zelda clone kind of thing. Um, I did some of the music for it, um, not all of it, but um, the guys were like really like focusing on that and I was more interested in going out to nightclubs and, and DJing and stuff at, at this point. Um, um, but yeah, they, uh, they managed to get it done. Uh, they released uh, another game as well called uh, Minsky's Furballs, I think it was called, I don't know if you've played that. Um, it's kind of like, um, 
that Kirby Avalanche game. I don't know if you've ever played that. Where you've got a yeah, yeah, Poyo Poyo, yeah, yeah. So in terms of myself at this point, I'd like I was kind of still flittering around in the demo scene uh, a fair bit, but um, in the UK at this around this kind of era, I think it's about ninety six, ninety seven. Like not much is really happening in the UK. Um, we can never really get a coder to like get the gumption to actually make a demo or anything. Um, but, um, uh, you know, music was getting, my, I was writing music for like the groups that I was in, Defect and Divine, and they were kind of getting used in little intros and stuff. Um, this thing here, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a disc mag? Yeah, a few nods there. So um, if you don't know what a disc mag is, um, basically it would be uh, a magazine on a disc, right? You put it in and you can read loads of articles. Um, so they'd be like news articles from the scene, um, uh, and people write all sorts of things. There was loads of them. They were very prolific back in the 90s. Um, and this was one that I was involved with uh, on the music, but also to, um, uh, I, think, I think this was the issue actually, where um, uh, they were already in set to, to, to publish it, except the coder of the music disc, of the, sorry, of the disc mag had gone on holiday for, or for three weeks or whatever. Um, and left it in a state that wasn't working. So they posted me the source code and everything, and then I had to hack the thing together to get the release done in, in like a couple of days. Um, so yeah, there's a, a couple of bits and pieces there. Um, so yeah, and then again, still with various groups. Um, TRSR, you've probably heard of them. They're um, a very popular uh, demo scene group and also uh, a, a bit of a cracking group as well, still to this day. Um, but this is a chip music disc. If you know what chip music is, pretty much anything that sounds like square waves, right? <laughs> so, um, so this is one that um, uh, it's got a bunch of C64 conversions that um, uh, me and my friend did in um, uh, Pro Tracker and a bunch of other like um, uh, you know own tunes as well. Um, and off the back of being uh, working with TRSI. Um, they released this, which was uh, an album called Cyberlogic, which they actually produced onto CD and released, which was uh, it was a bit of a big thing for me at the time. I'd never had any of my music physically released as a CD or anything. Um, and they basically took uh, Pro Tracker modules from all of the uh, C musicians that they knew and then got them mastered and then put them on the CD. And then I got a copy of the CD and I was this is amazing, right? <laughs> so good. Um, do I still have a copy? I didn't until someone from TRSI sent me one a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> um, so we're getting like, kind of getting at this point, you know, more into going out clubbing and just doing music really than like really focusing on what's going on in the demo scene. Um, but what happened here was um, like within, uh, you know, a bunch of us that we realized that, you know, we're never going to get our music used in a demo. Um, so uh, a, a chap called Hull, or Simon, uh, devised this idea of basically making a, a record label that was for ProTracker modules, right? So it was run by Simon. So there was a release schedule with it, right? So there wasn't just like things going out here, there, and everywhere. Every release had like a catalog number, had a write-up, you know, a nice bit of ASCII, um, you know, a bit of news that we might have of what's going on, you know, all the members. Um, so I was one of the founding members with um, uh, Subby and Twilight and Substance. So we were like, <clears throat> so the idea was just, you know, we've got all of this like musical talent in the UK that are doing great things with Pro Tracker and know where to put them, right? So Holds was like, well, let's just put them out there. People like mods, right? Let's just package them up in a nice little zip file, get them spread out by the swappers and the, and the modems and BBSs and then send them out there. Um, so I was doing this for... Um, a good four or five years, I think. So, and this this net label kind of progressed. It started doing um, PC tracker files, and eventually it was MP3s. It was just all like it kind of like you know, as the kind of technology progressed, like the type of files we would do would like you know change and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was going for years, years and years. Um, but yeah, there's there's a whole archive of, of all this stuff um, um, available. But um, yeah, so. Uh, Okay, oh, blimey, we'll blaze through this first half a bit quick, I think. <laughs> um, so this is when we get into the, uh, as, as I said, we're kind of moving away from the demo scene and it really kind of, uh, uh, at this point in the late 90s, 
Um, like really just not really interested in it at all. Just here I am with uh, uh, my friend Marcus here. Um, we were a DJ duo. We had like a, a residency at a local uh, techno club for about six years. Um, so we were doing that. Um, this is my friend Ollie. Um, uh, and uh, we were a DJ duo for uh, another five or six years in the early 2000s. Um, this is one of the vinyl releases I had. I had a, 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 you know, a few vinyl releases that got out there. This one in particular um, really uh, like pushed uh, mine and Ollie into loads of clubs. Like We were going all up and down the country. Um, we were getting booked to fly out to Spain, all expenses paid. Uh, booked to you know fly out to Germany. They're still doing like you know day jobs and what have you, but at the same time, like at the weekend, like you know, flitting off to like you know another part of the country, um, playing you know packed little dingy uh, boxes, you know like hundreds, uh, hundred room, hundred capacity little rooms, um, and then obviously going to the after party. Everything that's involved with that kind of culture, right? <laughs> to, to put it mildly. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, and uh, in terms of like, yeah, this is where my Amiga kind of really dies. So the, what I'm saying here is uh, do not use VHS backup systems. And the reason why I say that is that I used a VHS backup system to back up my entire Amiga onto a VHS so that I could clear off the hard drive and start again. And it did not restore. <laughs> <coughs> and I lost virtually everything apart from a pack of, uh, a pack of discs, That's pretty much. All gone, all gone. What happens next? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, welcome to part two. Um, uh, where are we? Why well, I love computers, part two. Okay, so you could, by now you probably got a good idea, or some of you know what the demo scene is anyway. Um, so a demo party is basically a, 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 an event, usually held over a, a two or three days, uh, uh, in a in a hall somewhere, um, and you'll have competitions in various categories. Whether that's uh, a demo that's like of any size on a particular platform, uh, old and new platforms. Uh, they could be size limited, which are you know limited, like your your program can only be 64 kilobytes in size. Um, music, graphics, uh, text art, you name it. There's all sorts of categories. Um, there's even a wild category where people have done, uh, uh, entered poems before. So, wow. you know, it can be anything. My favorite, the shader, I think. Yeah, the shader coding's pretty good as well, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you go to these events, you uh, work hard on your entries, whatever categories they're in, and then they get displayed on the big screen with the nice big sound system and everyone hears them. And uh, as that's happening, your heart is in your throat because it's, it's, it's your creation that you've done. And then afterwards you spend about 45 minutes with all the adrenaline Kind of running through your body. So, <clears throat> so um, I'd been to a couple of these uh, in my younger years. Um, I won't tell you too much about what happened at those when I was 15. Um, it is written about in some disc mags. I'm not even going to tell you where those are write, written up. <laughs> Let's just leave that there. <laughs> so, uh, but in 2010, uh, this happened. So this chap down in the bottom right here, this is Rory, or better known as RC55. And he ran a Sundown Demo Party. Um, he'd been running it for a, a bunch of years before 2010. Uh, but Rory um, had seen me DJ in Exeter a few times and uh, looked me up and then made the connection with me being from the old school demo seat. And then said, kept, kept inviting me to say, can you come to our demo party? You'll love it. We've got tracked music competition, right? You can write something in ProTracker, be like the old days, and then you can just play some tunes for us as well. Um, so yeah, this is, you see the hall here, this is where we all, we all sit, we all bring bits of hardware, whether it's, you know, to show off or whatever. Um, and uh, at the end of the night, we all go down to the beach, which is uh, very pebbly, which is quite interesting to walk on after a few beverages. <laughs> um, and we're all congregating outside. Obviously, here's a picture, which is a uh, juxtaposition with a Spectrum Plus 2 with uh, three and a half inch floppy disks, which doesn't make sense, but it's a demo party, why not? Um, so yes, I was very much interested to go to this party because I'd not been to a demo party in years and not done any demo scene activity or anything. So I entered the track music competition and uh, uh, <clears throat> not wanting to do things with emulators because I'm a bit of a purist, I ended up uh, finding my old Amiga 1200, which had a broken uh, keyboard. 
Um, so I housed it in an AT case with an AT power supply. With a, actually, it was an ATX power supply that was hot wired with um, uh, a bit of gaffer tape and some, some wires. Um, and uh, as with these kind of things, it got to the, the time when I was supposed to leave to go to the demo party and my music wasn't finished. So lo and behold, I take my entire studio PC with me uh, and the Amiga that's in a tower case and then proceed to finish the tune whilst I'm at the party. Hot, well, not hot swapping, swapping the IDE hard drive from the Amiga into the PC to transfer samples to it via WinUEE and then put it back into the Amiga to then finish the tune. Um, this is not ideal. <laughs> All right, don't do this. Don't be so proud. Use an emulator. Honestly, it's, it's just, just, it's fine. <clears throat> Make sure you test it on real hardware though. Um, so yeah, I'd... Um, kind of taken all of the knowledge and, and, and experience from going around DJing and releasing tunes and then thought, well, this is gonna, you know, let's try and put some of that, you know, some of that knowledge and some of that kind of style of music into Pro Tracker, which resulted in winning. Yeah. And I won $100 trillion, which is a fantastic amount of money. I think it's worth about half a pence. Um, so yes, uh, these, uh, uh, these were the prizes for that year. Um, obviously, being a small demo party, you know, prizes, really a demo party, the prizes aren't really why you, they're, they're never why you do it, right? The reason why you do it is because you, you, it's a creative, you want to out, out you, know, you just want to do something, right? It's never about the prizes. But when you get something like this, it's the first prize I'd ever won at a demo party, and it's still in that frame, and it's still on display in my house. So, so the interesting thing about going to this demo party was, um, I'd met people there, you know, because, you, you know, you go to, like, here today, we were just got getting on and chatting and, like, you know, sharing experiences. And I, and I went to this party, and there's about five or six people like, oh, you're Hoffman. You released all that music on mono back in the mid to late 90s. Like, yeah. Oh, I've heard of all your stuff. Yeah. So, so, like, meeting people that, like, had seen stuff that I'd done previously and then go, oh, wow, this is fantastic. I totally sucked in again, like, completely. Like by the end of the weekend, I was like, so are there still big parties in Europe? <laughs> where, where are they? Who's coming with me? Let's go. So, and uh, lo and behold, they told me, uh, well, yeah, the, there was one uh, about four weeks ago called Breakpoint. It's just finished. That was the largest demo party in Europe. I was like, oh, so, so I was like, oh, okay. And then uh, uh, gradually throughout the year, this was announced. Oh, no, hang on. So I've done this slightly around the wrong way. So um, after that, I was looking for a party, couldn't find one, but I was getting back into coding, getting back into the Amiga. Um, and as you know, as I told you, the uh, VHS backup was a complete failure. But what I did find was online archives like Mod Archive, Amiga Music Preservation Site, and Modland that had uh, around 200 plus of my Pro Tracker modules that I'd written all over the years, painstakingly archived for me to just go and download. And what I found in there was a selection of jungle tunes that I'd written that were called uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And what I'd done was start producing this, this music disc that was going to be one of those continuous things, like, a, like an hour-long jungle DJ set. And I found these and I thought, well, I'm not going to get anyone to be able to code this for me, so I'm going to have to learn it myself now. Right? So I did, I spent about a year uh, reading the hardware reference manual, learning 68,000, failing and succeeding and failing and succeeding <laughs> until eventually uh, I finished this music disc and released it at a party. Um, and I can show you that quickly now if I... And of course, being a bit older, the... Uh, Language in the scroll text is uh, nowhere near as fruity at this point. A little bit more mature now. Because the samples on the Amiga are 8-bit. That's why. Um, so yeah, I had to build everything myself, like found the code for the oscilloscopes, um, the disk system, everything. Spent ages and ages putting this thing together. <coughs> um, and yeah, you put the first disk in and it plays and plays. And then once it's run out of tunes on the first disc, this status changes from raving and asks you to put the next, next disc in, and then it carries on like that. And there's also um, 
hidden Easter eggs in there. If you put certain discs in and hold certain buttons, you'll get extra little bonus bits as well. So yeah, that is uh, so you get the idea. So, uh, Unreal is on there as well, the original Mega version. And uh, um, so yes, here we go. Now the big boy, revision. Um, so this was the first year, 2011, that it was put on. Um, and um, I tried to get the music disc ready for that release, to get released at revision. And uh, I was there at the party testing it and it kept crashing at random points, unbeknown to me as to what the problem was. So didn't get to release it there. But they had a tracked music competition and an MP3 music competition. So I was like, well, let's go in, <laughs> let's go in for those. Then again, like it's, it's the same same experience. I went to a small part in the UK. People were like, oh, I've, you know, I've heard your stuff before. Same here. I met loads of people, loads of really cool people. Um, and it's just the, the kind of social aspect of like a demo party is what what kind of really drew me in and and, and sucks you in. You meet just really cool people. You have good chats. It's just fantastic. Um, and lo and behold, winning again. <laughs> Um, so the funny thing about the track to music competition at, Re at Revision is that they allow formats that are not just ProTracker, right? So ProTracker is limited to four channels of 8-bit sound. Uh, they give you two megabyte of, of space, right, which is loads for a ProTracker module. But they also allow up to 64 channel trackers in there. Massive behemoth things, right, with loads of channels, which can do all sorts of things. Um, but almost every year, with one exception, a ProTracker tune has, for the Amiga, has won that competition. So I don't know whether that says more about the people that are viewing the competition in terms of like, you've got four channels, it's amazing what you've done with it, you know? I, it's, I, I don't know why it goes that way, but yeah. Um, so at that demo party, I met a, a chap called Booster, um, uh, someone else who I'd kind of seen online before. He was a member of Focus Design and had listened to my music that was in the music competitions and said, oh, we're, uh, we're this uh, demo group. Do you want to come and do some music for us and uh, you know, work on some productions with us? And I was like, well, I guess it seems like fun. Um, so yeah, so we worked on, um, uh, the, I think that's Hot Dots. I can't remember what, oh, that one's Mosaic and that one's Fracture. Um, so uh, we'll watch one of those now. So the first one that we did was um, a demo for the 060 AGA 1200 called Hot Dots, and this is limited to 64K in size. So it's the, the Amiga intro competition. So the executable has to have all the graphics, all the code, and all the music, all in 64 kilobytes. Now I've written statements of work, at work that are bigger than that, <laughs> <laughs> so. So there we go, Hot Dots by Focus Design. <laughs> so yeah, everything in 64K. Uh, it will need an 060, which unfortunately is uh, quite expensive for an Amiga, but you know.
use all 64K? I think we did. Yeah, most of it. I think there's not much left. Um, that's always the fun thing about the uh, size limited productions is sometimes like your content might compress well, sometimes it might not. So sometimes you might be like, mm, we've got 10K free, but we're finished and everything's there. How much did you get for the years? How, how, how much memory? Uh, we don't really kind of, what we do is we kind of, we just throw stuff in and then if we need to trim stuff up, if then we go ahead and do that. So I can't remember, I think the tune itself is like, I think it's 150K of Pro Tracker, but there's a lot of fluff that gets trimmed out of that that you don't need, right? So, and then there's sample compression on top of that, which halves the size of that. So, and then another compressor on top of that, which then squeezes it down even further. So, yeah, you start getting into the realm of like how to lay out data um, and then make the code simple. Like if the code is dumb, but the data is massive. Then you put that through a compressor and the compressor's like, no, we've got that. So, so yeah, lots of, lots of trickery that, you know, you start learning the more you kind of go into the, and delve into these things. Are there any rules on the competition as to how long can take to decompress you uh, yeah okay. yeah there is yeah um i think i think what they do is they give you a maximum running time which includes your decompression and pre-calc time so a lot of tricks that you'll see on on like a 64k when you run a 64k demo you'll usually see like a bar like that's it basically using algorithms to generate data right so you have a simple algorithm like a noise function right that just generates like noise that you could use for say clouds in a, an environment um, that will take time to render you know, that data, but it's like, you know, tiny little set of instructions that generates like gigabytes of data, but that obviously needs time for it to, you know, propagate into RAM. So that's, you know, there's all these things that you, you can do to like save space here and there. So, um, so yeah, so it was uh, working with a uh, focus design on a, a bunch of demos. You can find all of those on demo zoo or whatever. Uh, and then, uh, we had a, a, a brief, like, well, not brief, like, uh, uh, PT 1210, which is the, uh, it's, it's kind of, this is, it's done chronologically. So it kind of flits around a bit as like, I get distracted by various things in my life in terms of projects to do, right? It's always been the case. Like I, I'm doing something and then something shiny pops up over here. I'm like, oh, let's do that now for a, for a while, shall we? <laughs> then, or let's do this. So this is the Amiga DJ software. Um, this started out as a, a forum post on English Amiga board where a chap called Akira uh, asked the question, can you play a Pro Tracker tune faster or slower, but also repitch the samples so that they would match? So for example, if you, if you play a drum loop and then you play your tune faster, but you play the drum loop at the same speed, it'll all be out of time. So if you adjust the pitch of that sample up and down, then what happens is it keeps it all in sync. And as soon as I saw the question, I was like, well, he wants some DJ software, obviously, because uh, being a DJ, I understood how this, you know, what the principle was. Um, so we had a bit of a chat online. I asked some questions and then we made just like a, a, a really basic, like just the first version of it, which I don't have a shot of here, was just basically just a page of text with information that told me what was going on, right? And uh, we put the formula in to, to adjust the pitch and, uh, and that was it. Just had a quick play with it. And, I, and there I was like, like something I've wanted for years to be able to DJ with my Amigas was suddenly there. It was just instantly like, well, this works. Now we just need to make it look nice. So uh, <laughs> Akira did a lot of work on the graphics um, and the interface. Um, and then uh, Dopefish, uh, another friend of ours, uh, came in and helped out with the um, kind of improving the code and making it more reliable. And yeah, and that's, that's where we ended up. We ended up creating some DJ software for the Amiga, which is, uh, uh, and it's, it's over there. So <laughs> I don't know if you've popped over and had a quick look at it and had a play with it. Um, yeah, it's good fun. Um, so oh yeah, another, another little side uh, hustle here where uh, uh, I, one of the things that I've always wanted to do in my life was create a full album. And I did that and it's called Serenity. You can get that on my Bandcamp for free, I think. So, um, uh, but this is like a big departure for me in terms of music style. So a lot of my stuff had been like really big and like ravey and, and, and you know, bombastic and what have you and this album's completely different to that it's really chilled really atmospheric um uh and um yeah so we just kind of got it was, it was a complete departure um from what i was normally used to um 
and at the time I was obviously going to these, this big demo party and other demo parties uh, around Europe and meeting people that were making these fantastic demos for, um, for the PC, like big demos, you know, size limited demos. Um, and some of the, some of my favorite people, obviously still and fair light, just to, to, to that mention that I worked with that were making demos that I absolutely loved. Um, so kind of at the point where I was, um, uh, doing this kind of chilled stuff, I spoke to uh, Pixter from Still and said, I've, you know, I just messaged him and said, I really love your demos. Like, I really want to work with you. This is the album I've just produced. Like, does that kind of stuff interest you? And he's like, I've got, yeah, I'm working on something that needs <clears throat> something like that. Um, so he then went back with, right, I'll make you a, make a new tune. And then this is what came out of it. That was uh, Intrinsic Gravity by Still, by um, myself and Pixter. I mean, obviously Pixter doing all the important work there in the visual department. <laughs> yep. A little synchronizing. Do you mix the music and then he does the graphics and code to the music? Or is it yes. Really yeah, yeah. So the, the, as you'll notice like there in, like, in the previous demo and this demo, there's like, uh, there's, you know, big emphasis on synchronization, right? So it's supposed to be, is like that feedback with the music and the visuals, that interplay that they have. Um, another big thing that you kind of notice from here is that, you know, the, the PC can have much more like super impressive graphics, right? So, you know, I'm sure the GPU that was running on could have done like, you know, a, an entire world of, of whatever, right? But what happens is, is kind of a, in this kind of era now is like, it's not necessarily about the technical achievement, like I can get 500 sprites on screen, right? It's, it's, it's more about like 
the artistic nature of it, you know, the direction of it, you know, how does it make you feel, you know? So <clears throat> how did that one make you feel? Peaceful. Peaceful, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's about the link between the music and the, the graphics. Is that like hard coded, they're just playing at the same rate, or is there some sort of procedural link between the two? Uh, it's usually done by like, um, uh, like a timing system, right? So you'll know, so the, the, even if the graphics like falls behind by a number of frames, there's a, there's a time constant, right? So the time is always constant. And then uh, the, there's like, a, it depends on which system, like some people build their own, some people hard code those values. Uh, there's like something, there's like a tracker editor called Rocket, which is what a lot of people use. Um, and you can just feed that with the parameters that you want with your routines. And then you can just, you can basically just go through and edit the demo like in a tracker and like put all the parameters in and the parameter changes, camera switches and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so but it's it's not it's not something that you just like you feed the MIDI file in or whatever and then it does it like this that's a bad way to do it because you might want to say well just because the music's doing something doesn't necessarily mean we want to do something visually at that point so it's you know, it becomes like a, an artistic thing that you have to kind of play with as well like too much sync probably be too much but picking just the right bits to emphasize you know so um, and then. <clears throat> Onto, I can't remember what year this is, probably about 2016. I thought, why don't I make my own demo, right? Um, and uh, the reason that it always stopped me before is, uh, can I even do this? How do you even make one? Like, what is direction, you know? What is the idea, right? And, uh, and really the, the way to start is like, if you have an idea of, if you watch demos and you have an idea of what you like, right? What, you know, and then you try and, not necessarily emulate that, but you know, kind of feed off of that. Um, and the thing that I really liked is like kind of simplistic, like 2D stuff. So the Amiga is obviously a good choice because obviously it's bonus point because it's on the Amiga. Um, and I ended up doing in the size limited category. Um, and the reason for that is uh, the engine that I used um, is called Rose. Um, now anyone can pick this up, it's on GitHub. Um, and it's actually a graphical programming language that Blueberry made himself, right? <laughs> So a bit like, I think, Logo on the, is it on the BBC? Mm -hmm. Where the only thing it can do is uh, draw circles and squares in different colors. That's the only thing the engine can do, but it's, it's an entire programming language in there. So it can do sine and cosine calculations, multiplications, any kind of form of maths that you want. And, and you can have little turtles basically running around doing stuff, which is basically what it is. It's actually a turtle graphic system. Um, so obviously in 64K, um, even though the graphics engine and the data for that is really small, uh, gives me, I think it gave me about 58 kilobytes to play within the audio, but I wanted to push that a bit further as well. So I ended up building some rudimentary synth code as well to like really try and push the sound out a bit further. Um, and this is what happened. Uh, this runs on a standard OCS Amiga with 512K of RAM and 512, 512, so. There we go. <laughs>
<laughs> um, so yeah, uh, there I am making my own demos now. Like, wow, it's just, yeah, the app, you know, it's one of those things that, like, you know, making the first album, making your album, like, yeah, that's off the list. Making the demo, that's off the list. You know, so it's, all these things, like, I'm, I'm gradually just <laughs> getting through as many as I can. <laughs> um, so um, now we're on to uh, um, probably where I'm basically still sat in terms of, of groups. So obviously I've been working in Focus Design, doing some like collaborations with uh, various other people in other demo groups. Um, the, a lot of these kind of collaborations can happen quite organically. Like someone will have an idea about, you know, aesthetically what they want to do and they might approach a musician from somewhere else because they've heard their stuff and gone, actually that kind of style that you do would fit this perfectly and vice versa. So all of these kind of uh, things kind of come together organically. Um, similarly, um, music in small spaces. So we kind of touched on like synthesized engines in uh, the Amiga. So on the PC, obviously you've got uh, a ton more CPU cycles to play with, right? Um, and I met a, a guy called Ferris. Well, I, I'd seen a, a, a guy called Ferris uh, release a small intro that I was, I heard the soundtrack to this thing and I was like, it's, wow, what on earth have you built here that makes that kind of sound? And it was a system called Wave Saber. Um, so basically, I don't know if anyone here does music production in like Fruit Loops or, or a door or anything, is anyone? Yeah, yeah. So the engine uh, works by basically, we use Ableton, which is a, you know, off the shelf commercial tool, right? Yeah. <laughs> So it's an off-the-shelf off the commercial tool. And what the system is, is basically just a collection of VST plugins, right? So here's a list of the plugins here. So we build, we build a synthesizer, we put it in a, a plugin. We build an echo unit, we put it in a plugin. And then we just use those plugins like we normally would in Ableton, right? We write MIDI for them, we put in automation, we do all of that. So it's the workflow that we have for making music for small intros is the same workflow that we have essentially for making music like we normally would, right? So it's, it's the same, right? Um, uh, so yeah, we'd use this for like, there's a music competition called Executable Music and Demo Parties where you're, it's a Windows executable and it must not be bigger than 32K. And of course the PC 64K, your demos can only be big, can't be any bigger than 64K. Um, uh, so after working with him on a bunch of uh, uh, music releases, um, I'm um, yeah, sorry about the terrible image here. <laughs> uh, Ferris here on the left um, was uh, working on something, uh, a, a, a visual engine to make our first 64K. Uh, Wobble's a, a friend of ours as well. Um, and he was like, I'm working on this, I'm working on this demo. Um, we're gonna start a group. You're basically, you'll have to be a member now. So we'd like, we collaborated on music and um, became the best of friends along with Wobble. Um, and we've been logic homer ever since. So there was just something about the way we worked creatively. We could collaborate on music and it was, it was just, it just worked. Like someone would do something, they'd sketch out an idea, <clears throat> they'd leave it on the Google drive and then someone else would pick it up and do a bunch of stuff. And they go, well, that's great. I now know I can do this. So we'd like, in terms of the back and forth that we had creatively, it was just, it was perfect. Um, and, oh no, not that one yet. <clears throat> so then we released our first PC 64K demo. And I think this actually turned out to be, I think it was about 60K, I think in the end. Um, ah, no, this one was 64K. This is, so this is the second one that we did. Um, and I remember at the party, um, we were about half a kilobyte over. Um, which is, it's not a good place to be in when you're <clears throat> uh, three hours away from the uh, deadline. So uh, I quickly jumped into the uh, music project file and then halved one of the samples that I was using and then gave it back to him and he went, Psh. oh no, we're in, we're in, good. <laughs> so uh, this one's called Engage. So this is PC and uses all of your GPU. <laughs> Thank you. 
think I might have missed a video out, but we'll, we'll keep going anyway, because uh, I think in terms of time, we're getting close. Um, yes. Um, so yeah, we have to remember that, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about PCs and uh, Commodores and Spectrums in terms of demo platforms, but it's important to remember that uh, demo sceners will find anything to turn into a, a demo platform. Um, so one year at revision after um, uh, caning through the, the track to music competition quite consistently for a number of years, I kind of run out of ideas to do in, in that competition. Uh, and then one year leading up to it, I thought, well, why don't we, I had this idea of, I wonder if we could make a demo in the music competition, right? Why not? Let's give it a shot, right? So uh, this is uh, something called Reclamation. Um, so at Revision, they'll show the uh, X and plays like a module player, right? It'll play Pro Tracker and everything else. But in um, a Revision, they show this on the big screen, right? And uh, when you've got like a little four channel tune, it does look quite small. Um, so I thought, why don't we, I just did some tests. I knew they run it at 1080p. So if I have a full 64 channel tune and a massive pattern, can I fill the whole screen? And yes, you can. <laughs> so just some experiments. And then um, I spent about a month uh, making some code that would basically take a, a tune that I've written and then uh, apply the graphics to it. So basically separating that whole, so I don't, you know, you're not gonna sit there and like draw these in by hand, right? No, that's, that's a crazy thing to do. So, so the, the tool would basically, I'd write the music that would be like, say, 18 channels. Um, and then the tool would say, right, here's a program, put uh, all of these PNG images into these patterns and then loop it and then basically just work it all out for me. So I just like, there's, I want that there, that there, that there. Hit the button, take the file, inject all the graphics and spit it out at the end. I then spent two months writing the music because I wasn't used to using 18 channels in a tracker. I'm, I'm more used to four. So that was a real struggle, but... Um, and Ferris, who was supposed to be doing the visuals for it, had been slightly preoccupied at doing our 64K demo for that year. So uh, it wasn't until we actually met at the party and it was three hours before the deadline. So I was like, can I have some graphics now, Jake? And he was like, oh yeah, yeah, let's get that done now. So three hours before the deadline. Um, and also I found out uh, just before submitting that they were going to use a larger font that year so that the patterns would see, seem bigger. At which point I then went to see the demo competition crew and went, please do not use the large font because it's going to ruin three months worth of work. <laughs> so, um, so this is uh, Reclamation um, and uh, I've got the live uh, video for this one, which is, this one always cheers me up. So there's plenty of other examples out there in terms of the demo scene uh, of platforms that are not meant to be demo platforms. Uh, one of my favorite from recent years is something called Freespin. I don't know if anyone's seen this, where they made a demo run on a Commodore 1541 disk drive. So the disk drive has a CPU in it. Um, and what happens is the, uh, the Commodore 64 initially loads the demo into the, into the disk drive. 
and then you swap the cable with, I think it's like a resistor or something, and then that turns the disk drive cable into a video out cable, <laughs> which you then plug into a t back into your TV or your monitor, and then the motor is then used to play the music for said demo. Um, go and look it up, it is amazing. Uh, another one is uh, Cruising 2, which was a demo that was uh, created on the PlayStation 2, but you can't view it on the PlayStation 2. You have to hook it up to two oscilloscopes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, you know, why not? Uh, a craft by LFT. Um, everyone's probably seen quite a lot of the uh, LFT videos recently where he's been making uh, harmonicas, uh, was it, uh, no, accordions out of C64s and the rest of it. His tinkering never stops. He uh, basically made a demo on a microcontroller, an 80 mega microcontroller on a breadboard. Um, that was, I think it was like 20 megahertz with like 1K of RAM. Um, just sold it up on the breadboard and plugged it in and made a, a pretty impressive demo with it. Um, so yeah. Um, and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> oh no. So yes, no more demo parties in person. Um, and that was, um, it was a bit of a wounder for me um, to start with because uh, particularly when it had struck, um, I had flights to go to revision, um, which was in April, so always a, a Easter weekend. Um, I just spent the last four months building a, a brand new synth engine for another Amiga 64K demo that we were going to release. And then lo and behold, all the flights are cancelled, you're not going anywhere. Um, and the guys I, w I was working with who were like, well, they're going to do it online. Should we just, should, we're, we're this far already, we might as well plow on. So we did. Um, and I'm so glad we did because we did. I haven't got, I don't think I've got the demo on here, but, but yeah, so we plowed on. But at the same time, because the demo parties weren't in person anymore, it didn't quite feel the same. You, I mean, they were still doing them remotely and stuff and, you know, but and particularly for me, it's like the, the experience of the demo part is, is when you have your entry in the competition. And when that happens, like your heart is in your throat. Like it is, it's the most exciting thing ever. And, um, and like having the crowd reaction to it, you know, whatever that might be, you know, it's, that, that's the, the thing that was kind of lost for me, which was, um, which was sad. But, um, uh, but Neil to the rescue, we then made an album out of... Uh, <laughs> out of uh, uh, basically a, a lot of the stuff that you've seen already, the stuff that has been produced in the last 10 years, stuff that has been produced um, in the late 90s, all the music, Amiga music that I'd done, picked out, you know, the best bits that would go on the vinyl. And there it is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, th I thought you'd appreciate that one. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah I told you I was up until 11 making this. <laughs> um... So yes, so there I am, uh, not really into demo parties at the time because I couldn't go anywhere, I was stuck at home. Um, and uh, as I told you, the, a friend of mine back in the uh, 80s and 90s had an MSX. He also had a copy of this game for the MSX called Metal Gear, um, which is, <laughs> this is the original, this is the first version, well not this one, this is the Amiga one obviously, but the first version that was ever produced by Kojima was produced on the MSX by Konami. Um, and I played it and I was like, this is, you know, it was a bit of a groundbreaker at the time. Nothing was really quite like it. Um, and I was just turtling around um, uh, the internet and I found that someone, uh, not someone, a guy called Manuel Pazos had disassembled the entire game cartridge back into source code. And uh, I tell you, this, this, it's a mean feat doing that, especially if you think 128K is not a lot. It is when you have to label every single subroutine in someone else's code and you don't really know what they mean. Um, so I started just playing around. I was just looking at it. And then I started reading up on the uh, MSX hardware documentation in terms of how, how it displays graphics, how's the memory structured, how does it all work. And um, then, to, oh, well, I just, I tell you, oh, let's see if we can get the Amiga to display the graphics. Okay. Oh, well, there we go. I've got the title screen. Okay, let's get the tile set. Oh, there's the map data. Okay. Oh, I've drawn all the maps for the, the game now. Okay, let's get the character sprite. Let's, oh, let's put the movement code in. Oh, uh, oh no. Oh, oh, no. Right. Let's, we now have to finish the game. <laughs> <laughs> so my projects, they, they tend to start off as like, let's just kind of scratch the surface and then get lost in them. Like, you just, that, that's how they end up. Um, yeah, so as I said, it got, got really out of hand. Um, 
Uh, good friend of mine, uh, Tony Galvez. Um, we added a few little extra bits, obviously the full soundtrack uh, in the Amiga. Even did an emulated MSX soundtrack in it. Um, but he also added these, um, uh, these portraits that weren't in the original game. Um, we did loads of options and stuff. So basically just all the quality of life updates that we could kind of get into it without it like really running away with itself. Um, so yeah, um, and also you got to remember with these games, they're very coveted back in the 19... 1980s, so if you change them too much, you will have angry pitchforks, right? <laughs> you don't want that. Um, so yeah. Um, oh yeah, okay, and uh, yeah. So we then moved on to another game project, still, in, still kind of in lockdown at this point. Um, so I was curious about the disassembly process that Manuel Pazos had gone through. So I picked Nightmare, which is, again, these are terrible JPEGs, aren't they? Um, so I picked this because it was only 32K in size. And you probably, I'd rather me explaining like that if it's in 32K on an MSX, it means it's all in memory at once, right? It doesn't do any bank switching or anything like that. Um, so I thought that was a good, good, like, was a good little start. Let's see if I can disassemble it. Asked uh, Manuel about the tools he used. Um, and then that got out of hand. And then I disassembled the entire game and all of its assets, which then meant uh, uh, I showed um, Tony what I was doing. I was like, look, because he loves MSX games as well. I was like, look, I've, uh, hit, here's the game. I've got the character. It's scrolling. The, the tiles are there. The attack waves are there. It's like, I should do you new graphics for everything. <laughs> I was like, great. And then the new soundtrack. And then again, ported the whole thing to, uh, to the Amiga and then released that all again for free. Um, because this belongs to Konami, does not belong to me. I can't charge for this, right? <laughs> so yeah, so spending an, like an entire year of all your free time uh, to release a game for free, um, mental, right? <laughs> so why would you do that? I mean, it is fun. I really enjoy doing it. Um, which then brings us on to right up to date. Oh no, actually I'll skip that because we are running out of time. Um, what I can tell you is I was distracted by Blueberry to do something for the Commodore Plus 4. Um, that's the specs of the sound chip. Um, it is terrible. It is two channels, yeah. One waveform, noise on one of them, and there's one volume control for the whole thing. So, uh, but that's, that's a tracker called Ted Zacker, which kind of takes all of the pain out of it. Uh, but it is brutal. It's a brutal system to use. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, we I think we've run out of time anyway, so we can't, can't play that. But yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, and then we get on to Seekanoid, which is the thing you've been playing today. Um, uh, well, actually, you've been playing Yugatron, which is the sub-game in Seekanoid. So this is a game by uh, Gareth Noyce. Um, he's a good friend of mine. He asked me to do the music for the PC version when he uh, released that quite a few, a few years ago. Um, but I approached him because I was looking for another game project. Um, I said, do you mind if I port this to the, to the Amiga? And he's like, of course I don't mind. <laughs> like, why, why would I not want that? Um, and they'd already published it on the Switch via Thalamus. So if you remember Thalamus from the C64 days. So they, they basically, there's like, they're still kind of going. Um, so the original game is based on, it's like got a ZX Spectrum kind of theme. It's based on uh, Cybernoid and Robotron and it's twin stick. Um, porting it to the Amiga 500, it's very nearly finished. I think, hopefully, by the end of next month, I should be able to hand it to testing and then have it all blow up in my face. So, um, but um, in terms of the original game, it's all pretty kind of, it's all pretty much there, but um, I wanted to add some extra stamps to it. So I added a, another brand new soundtrack uh, to it and a ton of Easter eggs. And this is uh, one of my favorites. Oh, well, here, so there's the specs for it, um, up to a thousand particles. So from all the stuff I'd learned on the other games, I'd really kind of loaded this one with, with the tech, right? Like, and, it, and when you look at it, it, you think, oh, well, the particles are quite impressive, but like underneath the bonnet, there's so much more stuff going on, like the, the collision detection systems. The sound is effectively 11 channels in game. So there's four channels of sound effects at the same time. And the music system, although it's three channels of Pro Tracker, one of those is actually four channels. So, so it's uh, <clears throat> a lot of you know layering all this stuff in and, and getting it all up and running. And there's Easter eggs all over the place. Now I'll show you uh, the one that I. If you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen this. But where is it? So the sound is actually coming out of the Amiga's audio port and then being fed into the uh, tape adapter there.
Thankfully, this doesn't take five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think we are yes so why do you love computers so much then um because they're great right aren't they yeah <laughs> there we go um and that's it that's me done Excellent. Okay. <laughs>